So, uh, so before I begin, uh, let me uh, take a quick, uh, very quick poll. So uh, I'd like you to think back uh, 400 years. Now in America, 400 years is a long time. Uh, in Belgium, it's not so long. So uh, about, uh, about uh, 20 years ago, my wife and I went to uh, Bruja. Uh, Bruja, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, very, very old place. Uh, so Europe is, uh, and Belgium has a lot of really old stuff. So think back 400 years. And uh, think of some of the biggest innovations in, um, let's say, uh, transportation. So just w w what have been the big innovations in transportation in the past 400 years? Cars. Trains. Planes. Trains. Solid fuel. Rocket engines. Inertial guidance. Navigation. So the list goes on and on, right? Okay, now let me ask you, uh, again, think back 400 years. What have been the biggest innovations? So we are, we are all in an educational institution. We are all educators. What have been the biggest innovations in education? <laughs> Thank you. PowerPoint. Uh, how, many, <laughs> how many people believe PowerPoint was going backwards as opposed to going forwards? <laughs> I still teach with a blackboard, but uh, so you get my point. We really have not had any big innovation in education in, uh, in 400, uh, 400 years. I like to say that uh, the biggest invention we've had in education was the printing press. That was 500 years ago. So uh, this was a classroom um, at MIT about uh, 50, 50, 60 years ago. Uh, take a look at the classroom. And uh, that's a classroom today. What's changed? The seats, the seats are in color. <laughs> but otherwise, you know, not much has changed. Uh, they, have sliding, uh, they have sliding blackboards, which are quite nice. But not much, uh, not much else has changed. So really, if you look back in all of these years, education really hasn't changed a whole lot. We have, we have not, even though we are all research universities, we have not really innovated in education. So despite the fact that there's been no innovate, not much innovation in education, uh, we also have um, very poor access to education for students around the world. So in many, many countries, many parts of uh, uh, Europe or Asia or the US, in many, many cities and towns, people don't have very good access to education. So this is uh, a scene from the Abu Fame University in Nigeria. This is an actual classroom. So you've all heard of uh, distance education, right? Now this is long distance education. <laughs> so the people, sitting, the people sitting way in the back, here's the professor with the, uh, with the chalkboard. Okay, now this is long distance education. So in a large part of the world, people don't have access to very high quality education. So edX's mission, so edX was formed about a year ago. It is a nonprofit enterprise. It was formed by Harvard and MIT to really increase access to education for students around the world. Our mission is also to reinvent campus education. Okay, so we care very much about how do we teach on campus? How do we improve education on campus? How do we rethink and reimagine on campus education? And as I do this talk, I'll give you many proof points. I'll give you a lot of proof to show that the online education that we are doing, MOOCs, are going to come back and change our campus education. So all of you heard, of, heard about MOOCs. Okay, massive, open, online courses educate the world. But a big part of our mission is to change how we do things on campus. So in this talk today, I'm going to show you how we bring this technology back on campus and why edX cares a lot about campus education and give you proof points for how we're going to change things. So edX is a nonprofit. Our platform is open source. So once we build the platform, we're going to give away the platform to everybody in the world so all of you can help improve the platform. It is an open source platform is also very important because, is, because it takes away a lock-in risk. 
So, uh, you know, uh, if, uh, if you all come on board edX and put your courses on edX, if a year or two from now, <clears throat> You want to go and take the platform, the open source platform, and go and do it on your own. Create a European consortium and say, bye-bye USA. You know, we're, we're Europe. You're going to do it in Europe. You can take our platform and go and do it. So that's the beauty of an open source platform. There's no lock-in. <clears throat> There's no lock-in risk. So edX is a portal, edX.org. And our university partners put courses on the platform under the brand name of uh, the X brand. So the edX, the X brand has become uh, a very famous brand. So Berkeley puts courses as Berkeley X uh, and so on. So we have uh, 12 partners. Uh, we don't care so much about numbers. If we cared about numbers, we would say we have 26 partners because uh, uh, the U University of Texas system has 15 universities. So. Uh, this is not a numbers game. We are in this for quality. So depending on how you count, we have 12 universities or uh, 26 universities. edX is also focused on research. We do a lot of uh, data mining on the platform where, as students are learning, we're gathering a lot of data. And so we're doing research on how students learn. In fact, I like to say that edX is like the particle accelerator for learning. It's like CERN for learning, where we have this big, giant particle accelerator. This is an online platform where we can do huge tests, huge studies in education and pedagogy with, a, with, a, with large numbers of students. And in fact, we, we are looking forward to discovering the Higgs boson of education. <laughs> and we will do that. So we also have a services organization that helps universities create courses. So this is uh, our portal. Ah, this picture is old. Johannes, we got to update the picture. So this, this shows six partners. Now we have uh, 12 partners. And uh, you can see a large number of courses. Uh, here is a, uh, uh, this is the uh, Greek, a course on Greek history by Professor Naj, uh, Harvard. This is a uh, course on justice. Uh, this is a course on uh, public health. Uh, graphics, VLSI, artificial intelligence. So uh, each of these, are <coughs> excuse me, each of these are courses created by professors in our uh, partner institutions. And we cover all disciplines. We cover humanities, law, medicine, engineering, sciences, business. We'd like to be in all fields. There is no field that uh, we do not want to cover. <clears throat> One of the amazing things about MOOCs is the M, massive. The numbers are really amazing. So if you look at uh, a typical universities, so these are numbers from uh, MIT. Now, now compared to, uh, compared to uh, your university, MIT is very small. So MIT, uh, in, in uh, last year, had about 20,000 applicants. And they accepted about 10% of the students. Okay, so accepted about 1,600. But uh, our first course, which we offered one year ago, was a course on circuits and electronics. 155,000 students took the course from 162 countries. <coughs> so 155,000 students. So this number. It's a big number. This is bigger than the total number of alumni of MIT in its 150-year history. edX now has uh, more than 700,000 students from around from 192 countries. And uh, if we we'll go, go back to this course, 155,000 students took the course. About uh, uh, 26,000 students tried the first problem set. You can call them active students. And then 7,200 students passed the course. So if I were to teach at MIT for 40 years, if I were to teach for 40 years, I would be able to teach this many students in my class. So for professors, if, so as, as a professor, 
you want to teach students, you want to spread the word, you want to have an impact. So as a professor, this is incredible. You can have a huge impact, not just in your own university, but uh, around the world. What is also amazing is the technology is so powerful that we use the same staff resources that we use in an on-campus 100 student class to teach this big uh, worldwide MOOC class. Uh, I want to show you some results. These classes can be very, very successful. So we teach a MOOC class where students around the world take it. But we, but we also teach a class within a campus. So what we did was we took the edX course, the circuits course, which we taught to 155,000 students. And edX can also take that same course and package it up and offer it privately in a campus setting. That is not a MOOC. It's called a SPOC, Small Private Online Course. Okay, So uh, edX hosted a small course for uh, San Jose State University in Silicon Valley. And so there, that's an on-campus. So throughout my talk, I will talk both about MOOCs and also about on-campus education. Remember, edX cares deeply about on-campus education. We want to, really a big part of our mission, and I'm sure many of you as professors, you know, a big part of our mission is to improve how we teach. Can we do better? So here at San Jose State, they flipped the classroom. So students went and watched videos and interactive exercises in the dorm, in the hostels, came back to class, and had discussions in class with the professor. And the results were amazing. So this is the bottom line results. In past years, that same class at San Jose had a 41% failure rate. 41 out of 100 students would fail the class. It was a very hard class. With the edX platform and technology, that fell down to 9%. So significant improvement in uh, performance when this was taught in the uh, San Jose State course. So we can significantly improve the quality of uh, education in, uh, in campus classes. Other interesting things happen. So uh, here, in uh, this land far, far away, it's far from America, far from here, a professor got some students together. This is a high school. So in this high school, students, again, he flipped the classroom in the high school. The students would do the videos and exercises in their own homes and come to class and they would do problem solving in class, do some laboratories in class. This was amazing. 20 high school students did this course uh, in this flipped model in this uh, land far away. Any guesses where this happened? We discovered this when they wrote a blog about this. Any guesses where this was? China? No? Korea? No? Give you a hint. Mongolia. So here's a, here's a MOOC class from uh, Boston. And in Mongolia, a high school teacher got 20 students and uh, had them take a, uh, a very hard uh, third year MIT class. So uh, all kinds of impact is uh, being felt all around the world. So next, let me talk, uh, spend a few minutes talking about what does a class look like? Okay, what does an online class, what does an online platform look like? So uh, this is the uh, artificial intelligence class from uh, Berkeley X. Okay, taught by Dan Klein. So here, students have many, uh, many activities. So uh, one activity is courseware, where they do uh, uh, courses, and I'll talk about that. Uh, the other pieces, there's a discussion forum, there's a, a, a student dashboard, there's a professor dashboard. Uh, with the student dashboard, the student can follow their progress. With the professor dashboard, the professor can follow a student uh, progress and also look at some analytics for uh, student performance in real time. It's very useful for a professor. So let's start with the courseware. So edX, edX has put a lot of effort into pedagogy, online pedagogy. 
how do we organize an online course? How do we organize the UI, the user interface, for an online course? So edX courses are organized by week, week one, week two, week three. Okay, so students follow in a sequence. Oftentimes when you go to the web, you see a bunch of information there and you get completely lost. But with edX, all the information is there, and if a student wants, they can jump around, but edX creates a sequential path to the whole course. So there is a sequential path that a student can follow from beginning to end. If the students don't like it, they can jump around, but we have a sequential path starting with week one and you keep going down till you come to the end. So during a week, there are some activities that the students do. So in your class, uh, what, do, what do students do each week? They do uh, maybe two lectures. They come to a place like this, they do a couple of lectures. Maybe they do some homework, maybe they do some laboratories. <clears throat> So here what we do is, there are no lectures. So we replace a lecture with what we call a learning sequence. Okay, this is a learning sequence. So in a lecture, a professor talks and students sit in the classroom and they listen to the professor. Now, if your students were anything like me, when I would sit in a lecture, usually around five minutes, around the five minute mark, I would usually lose the professor. I was not very smart, and the professor writing on the blackboard. By the time the professor got to here, I would lose the professor, and then the professor kept going, and, uh, and I could not stop the professor. So then I was just sitting there scribbling notes, and the professor kept writing. I could not stop the professor. I could not rewind the professor. <laughs> it's game over. So after five minutes, I would completely lose the professor. It was just a, my being there was a total waste of time. Now, if you're much smarter than me, okay, uh, maybe you follow the professor. And if you're very, very smart, you're probably getting bored because the professor is going too slow. <laughs> so for some people, he's going too fast. For some people, he's going too slow. Some people are asleep. Some people don't show up. So lectures are, have a real problem in that uh, it's just not uh, the right speed for everybody. But with online, if you can go online, you can pause. Students can rewind. You can even hit the mute button on the professor. <laughs> in fact, we took a poll. And uh, when we taught this class in online format at uh, MIT, four out of five students said that they're watching the video and under mute and reading the transcription and, and running the video at 1.5 times the speed. A majority of the students are watching the video at 1.5 times the speed. You can, uh, you can play, you can rewind your different speeds, and you get a transcription. You can navigate by clicking on the transcription as well. So let's talk about learning sequences. So a learning sequence, a learning sequence replaces a lecture. Okay? A learning sequence is a sequence of short videos interleaved with interactive exercises. Okay? So uh, you have a video, a video, you have an exercise. You have videos, you have an exercise. Each video is about five to ten minutes long. Short video snippets. And many studies have shown that the attention span of students is about five to 10 minutes. So here you're giving people information in five to 10 minute chunks. And then you ask a question. So this is very much like the Socratic method. In the Socratic method, you teach by asking questions. So here, we made it part of the UI. You interleave questions with videos. So before a video, you can ask a question, make them think, and then show them the video. Or you can show them a video and then ask a question and test their knowledge to see if they got it or not. So this is a very, very compelling way of teaching. So this style of learning, where you're teaching by asking questions, is called active learning. And studies have shown that this kind of active learning where you're interacting with the students, engaging the students, 
will have much better retention in terms of uh, knowledge retention by the students. So uh, anybody here uh, read this paper by Crack and Lockhart? Just click on that. Yeah, the connections. You're sure the whole place won't explode, right? No, I, mean, I hope so. Yeah, it's okay. So, uh, so anyone seen this paper? So this is a really, really famous paper in education. If there's one paper you read in education, I would read the Craig and Lockhart paper. This is a landmark paper, 1972. So they showed that if you engage the student deeply while you're teaching, they retain the information for much longer than usual. And this paper was the foundations of this whole field called active learning. And what edX does with these learning sequences is really this form of active learning. And what's really funny <clears throat> is that I've been teaching for 25 years. Okay, I've been a professor at MIT for 25 years. And it's really sad that I discovered this paper after I did edX. <laughs> so I've been teaching for 25 years. I had no idea what this was. In fact, in most universities, you, know, you graduate with a PhD, you become a professor, and they send you to teach. Would they let you drive a car without learning how to drive? We're not researchers. OK, but in my 25 years as a professor, as a teacher, I, I, I didn't read a single paper on how to teach. Let me ask you a question. How many professors here? How many of you have read, how many of you have read papers on education research? Very impressive. <laughs> very, very impressive. Uh, leaders, you should be very proud of your team. <laughs> we, we prepared the plans before coming. Ah, uh, <laughs> this is, I just heard that you prepared before the lecture. So I should say, if I ask the same question in the US, everybody would be looking at each other. <laughs> so I, I hadn't read education papers. So, so we just start teaching without really understanding how to create methods that work for students. But now with online learning, I think we've made education exciting. A lot of people now are, are paying attention to education. People who are graduating with education degrees are now suddenly hugely in demand. So, this is a, so the learning sequences really is one of the key approaches to, uh, uh, to teaching online. So next, let me show you uh, some examples of videos. There are many, many ways of capturing video. Uh, one of the poorest ways is to record a professor teaching on a blackboard. Sometimes people do that. It's not great. But this is a very popular way of doing it. Uh, this is uh, what we call a Khan-style video. How many people here have seen uh, videos by Salman Khan? So he's got a lot of videos uh, for high school students. So Salman Khan was my student, and he's been a big inspiration to me and to a lot of people around the world. So I call this a Khan style video. So let's see if the audio, uh, if the audio works. So I'll play a little video, and uh, this is an example of a video snippet. OK, it's not exactly equal. Okay, it's more or less equal to uh, each other. Okay, B plus more or less equal to B minus. I can play it again. Now that the volume's gone up. Okay, so you see this uh, amazing thing happening? And the key is that the stable point is when V plus equals V minus. Okay, it's not exactly equal. Okay, it's more or less equal to uh, each other. Okay, B plus more or less equal to V minus. So we've taken some, uh, we've done some studies on this particle accelerator where we can take, we, when you have hundreds of thousands of students taking a course, you can do a quick uh, survey and instantly get feedback. And uh, we are finding that students really like the style where you handwrite as opposed to using uh, you know, PowerPoint. So students really like this handwritten style. And you can uh, record your voice uh, speaking as you handwrite. Students really like, uh, like this approach. So this is one way of recording a video. And you can record five to 10 minute uh, uh, snippets. So with these videos, as I said, students can hit the pause button. They can rewind. They can really pace themselves. OK, so that's my second proof point. 
My second proof point is this, which is that when students can control their own pacing, they can control the pace at which they learn, that improves learning outcomes. Okay, so this was a 2003 study that when students who were able to press a pause button and continue button simply had better learning outcomes. Okay, second example of how the way we do learning, online learning, can actually do much better than how we do things in the traditional classroom. So, the, so learning sequences with videos and interactive exercises is a key part of the process. So I talked about videos. Next, let me talk about uh, exercises. Now, when you have 100,000 students taking a course, you cannot be sitting down and grading by hand. You cannot be grading papers by hand. Everything has to be done by computer. And I'll show you some really, really cool things. You can even do humanities by computer, believe it or not. Okay, I'll show you some techniques for, I'll show you three techniques for grading essays and show you some results for, for humanities classes. So here, this is for a chemistry class. So we have a number of techniques that we use to grade automatically. We can grade equations, we can grade chemical equations, we can grade graphs, we can grade a number of things. So here I'll show you an example of uh, grading chemical equations. And so you ask the students a question, and the students will uh, type in their answer, and the machine and the computer in the cloud will automatically check if it's right or wrong. Okay, so I'll play with a little video. And so these can be exercises interleaved with videos, or this could be part of a homework exercise. Okay, completely graded automatically. So let me show you a little video. So the student is entering a chemical equation. As they enter it here, this is how the equation would appear in the textbook. Up, they got it wrong. Well, they can try again. They got it wrong again. They tried again, and they got it right. So imagine, with the homework, you tried once, and then you submit the homework, and then uh, it, it may take two weeks. Uh, so what's the average time uh, you give homeworks back to students in, uh, in this university? A week? How many people give it back in a week? Two weeks? Two weeks? One day? Five days? One month? So anyway, so it could be anywhere from one week, two weeks. So as a student, there's no instant feedback. Okay, so I submit the homework and I completely forget about it. But here online, you get instant feedback. And so you can try, you said, ah, oh, I got it wrong. Huh. Let me go look at a video and understand and come back and try again. So you can keep trying till you can get this, uh, uh, till you can get this right. Okay, so the key here is that you can try again and again and check the answer until you get it right. And so uh, we have a key characteristic here, the green check mark. The green check mark will tell the students that they got it right. In fact, this green check mark has become something of a cult symbol at edX. So students uh, send us emails saying that they go to sleep at night dreaming of green check marks. <laughs> so, uh, you know, funnily enough, you know, talking about, uh, you know, talking about, uh, you know, green check marks, uh, one of the students who took this course, you know, one of the students who took this course in spring, in, uh, you know, January of last year, took one course, and then he took another edX course, oh, thank you. Took another edX course in the fall from Berkeley. And when he started the Berkeley course, this is what he said on the discussion forum. <laughs> this is what he said of the green tick mark. <laughs> Students really, really like that instant feedback that they get from green tick marks. Now, it's not just fun, it is also proven. <clears throat> it's a good idea. This study by Chen, at AL in 2010 showed that if you give students rapid feedback, it improves learning outcomes versus no rapid feedback. That's my third proof point. So why am I showing you these proof points that online learning can improve student outcomes? The reason is that MOOCs have been given a lot of hype. Oh, we registered 50,000 students. We registered 150,000 students. But what I want to show you is that at edX, we try to improve the quality of education as well. It's not just about numbers. It is about quality of education. It's about the research and how people learn. It's a big distinguishing factor of uh, edX. You'll hear the word quality and outcomes and results a lot more than elsewhere. 
So we'll notice here that instant feedback is a really good thing. So next, I'd like to talk about discussion forums. So discussion forum builds communities. So students do online classes. They do videos, exercises, homeworks. And then how do you ask a question? In the traditional class, you go to a professor and you ask a question. Here, when you have 150,000 students in your class, there's no way you can go and answer every question. So you be, we have a discussion forum on our platform. So on the discussion forum, students ask questions. Now you may wonder, if you have 150,000 students asking questions, how do you answer such questions? But this works for two reasons. Any ideas? Why does this work? Often the same question. Pardon? Often the same question. Often the same question. OK, so uh, in, a, in a traditional classroom, if 30 students have the same question, they each come by your office, and you answer the same thing over and over again. But here, that too. So two ideas. So, so here what happens, if you have the same question, how many of you are on Facebook? So, how, so you know about like on Facebook, right? You can like something. You can upvote something. So on edX, you can upvote something. You can like something. So if someone asks a question, and you have the same question, you can upvote it. So we are bringing social, the community, modern social networking ideas into learning. And you can upvote the question. So if 30 students have the same question, they'll simply go and upvote the question. And so uh, the same question doesn't get asked over and over again. So that's one idea. The second idea is students answering each other's questions. And I discovered that. Uh, when we were, we were teaching this course, at, uh, I was up at 2 o'clock at night, and uh, someone asked a question. I was typing the answer. I don't type very fast. I'm a slow typer. My 13-year-old 13 13 year daughter types faster than I do. So I was typing the answer, and before I, before I could finish my answer, you know, a, a student from Pakistan responded, and the answer was not quite right. So I said, OK, let me go and fix the answer. So I, I was going to fix it. Before I knew it, someone from New Zealand popped up and said, oh, here, here's how you can change the answer. And then I sat back and watched it. And, and, and you know, as I watched it, Colombians, Pakistanis, Europeans, people from all over the world were popping back and forth and discussing it. And towards the end, they got the right answer. And professors have a way of blessing an answer. I can put, say, I, as an as a instructor, I can say, good answer. That's it. And students are telling us that they are learning by teaching. So these are the two ideas whereby these discussion forums really, really work. So next, let me ask the question. So, uh, so far, I've talked about discussion forums. I've talked about exercises, chemical equations, and other things. How do you teach humanities? How do you teach humanities courses? So what we've discovered as we've uh, talked to professors who are teaching humanities courses, there are two important features that we've added to the platform for humanities courses. One of those features is in humanities courses is, is, is small discussion groups. So we have a 150, a huge discussion forum, a global discussion forum. But in a humanities course, you may want to have a group discussion among a small number of students. So we've added a feature to a platform called cohorts. So cohort is a way in which the professor can take a big discussion group and divide that into many small discussion groups. So you can have 20, you can have 100, small number of students, and you can have many, many, many small groups. And so and there's also a way in which a professor can assign a moderator we call that a community TA for the discussion forum. So what, you, what the professor does is he announces to the course or to a previous offering of the course, asks students if they want to serve as a community TA, and then those community TAs can help in the new discussion forums. Okay, so that's the technology, the cohort technology, something we've implemented in the platform. A second important uh, that technique is how do you grade open response questions? So let's say you have uh, either short answer questions or you have essays. How do you how do you how do you grade that? So any guesses on uh, any guesses on how we use three techniques to do that? 
and a professor can combine those techniques. So any ideas? Pardon? You can do uh, so. You can use you can use machine learning to grade it uh, through keywords or other other techniques. So that's one approach. You can you can do peer grading. So so one is machine learning grading. I'll show you some results. Machine learning grading. Second is peer grading, and third is self-assessment. Students can grade themselves. Okay. So um, so here is self-assessment, and where students can grade themselves. The professor provides a rubric. And students can grade themselves. That's one approach. Second grading is machine learning assessment, okay, where a computer algorithm scores the students. Now, many years ago, it was based on keywords. But now, this has become very, very sophisticated. Okay, it's much more sophisticated than just keyword search. And these sophisticated machine learning algorithms can grade uh, students, and I'll show you some results. Uh, I'll show you some results. The results are absolutely amazing. The third technique is peer grading. With peer grading, students can grade each other's work. Now, each of these techniques has drawbacks. And so this is still experimental and a work in progress, and we are finding ways to combine the three techniques to get the best of, of these three approaches. So I'll show you some results of uh, machine learning grading. So this is the combination. So for example, uh, you know, uh, with these flexible assessment types, so uh, what you could do is you can take a response, a freeform response, you can self-assess it, and then machine learning grade it. If the self-assessment self and machine learning are different, then you can go to peer grading. Okay, so you can have many of these techniques, and we want to do research on what is the best way to grade uh, freeform questions. So we've introduced all three on the platform right now, and these are being used in, uh, in, uh, in various courses. So I'm just going to show you a dashboard. Uh, this is not great to see. Uh, this is uh, a student submits a free form essay. Student does self-assessment on the dashboard. And then uh, this is the result from machine learning. Uh, it's not very really clear. I'll just show you the results. So here are some results from uh, machine learning. Okay? Uh, here I'm going to show you results for short answers. And then I'll show you results for uh, long form essays. So here, uh, this is the actual score by an instructor, and this is the predicted score. So what we did was uh, we took, had an instructor grade a certain number of uh, essays, and then we had the machine uh, grade the same essays, and to see how well the two correlated. So here, notice that uh, a big circle implies, out here, says that many essays were given that score by given a score of three, by the instructor, and the score of three was given by the machine. So if you see big circles, so the number of, so number of scores given relates to the area of the circle, okay? So if you see many big circles on the diagonal, that means machine learning was very accurate. Okay, so you can see that you know, there are some errors, but generally you can see that uh, the machine learning has done uh, quite well. It seems to do better when the essays are very good, but it, it, it it's not, doesn't seem to be able to distinguish too well between essays that are uh, between 0 and 1. Let me show you another result. So this result shows you, these are for essays, the long, uh, long essays, and uh, this is percent error. Okay, so here we compare two things. The red curve is human to machine, and the blue curve is human to human. So this says, you, so you, we take a bunch of essays, and then we have multiple human beings grade the essay, and uh, this shows the variance. So this is many different essay types, many, many, many essays. So this shows the error. So this says 5% error, and this uh, goes all the way up to about 10% uh, error. So you, uh, the blue curve is human to human. So if I grade something and you grade something, we both are not going to give the same grade. Okay, so blue is the human, human error. Red is human to machine. What do you see here? What you notice is that the variance between human to human is not very different from the variance between human and machine. So machines are wrong sometimes, but notice that machine to human is no worse than human to human. And these are for essays. So these are very significant results. 
And, uh, and we believe that uh, these will really help us uh, grade free-form essays, which are very common in uh, the humanities subjects. Uh, another challenge that uh, people have asked us is, how do you do, uh, how do, you do laboratories? So free-form answers are one thing. OK, you can grade them. How do you do labs? Well, uh, the edX platform is pretty unique in that we can do lab uh, uh, laboratories as well. We have a virtual lab. So what we do is uh, virtual laboratories allow you to do design. So we give students a blank sheet of paper online. They have a bunch of components. And they can build designs using these components and analyze them. And a machine can grade them. So I'll give you a little example of a circuits lab, completely online. So a student builds a design. It's all uh, uh, a circuit design online. Now, this, this has been sped up. <laughs> the student is not that fast. And so uh, and here's the output. So this is a virtual lab, just like you would see in a physical laboratory. And we can grade this, uh, grade this as well. And this is almost like a video game. And students say they just love this kind of uh, uh, interactivity. We have another. We also have labs. The student, a modern day student have grown up playing video games with music and, and uh, building, constructing things and so on. Here's another type of uh, a lab with music in it, where we input music and allow students to play with music. OK, so I'll play you this lab. See, so a student picks uh, reggae music and passes it through a circuit. And they can hear how it sounds. Can we get the volume up? Okay, now the student changes the design. You can see it's more muffled now. So students can change the design and uh, see how it sounds, much like they were building a real experiment in, uh, in real life. So we incorporate music into these labs as well. When, when students finish, they get a certificate. So edX gives a real nice looking certificate. It comes from edX and from MITx. And so uh, it's signed by uh, the appropriate official in the uh, university. And they get a real certificate uh, from MITx. So, uh, so what are the initials here, U, C, L? UCL. So uh, for the UCL course, they would get a certificate from UCLX. So the, so the X is a really good idea because this way they get a, students get a certificate from UCLX. And if they come to your campus and, and they say, oh, I've taken this course, you can tell them, ah, that's a course from UCLX. It's not a campus course. So you have a choice if you want to give them credit or not credit on your campus because it's UCLX versus UCL. So the X brand is for the external MOOC book brand. So we have students from uh, all countries around the world. So uh, the USA is number one. Uh, India is number two. Uh, UK is number three. You want to guess who number four is? China. Nope. China. Not. <laughs> Colombia. So, uh, so Belgium. Uh, so, so once. Uh, so once. Uh, so once uh, once UCLX comes on board, I hope to see uh, I hope to see uh, Belgium uh, Belgium go up. Where's China? So China has a problem. The thing with China is that uh, China blocks uh, videos from the U.S. in China, and so uh, so because of that, uh, uh, we, we try to work with some of the organizations in China to create special hosting uh, out there. So that's a real problem, which is why China is very small. So China is, uh, I, think it's, uh, I think it's about 1% to 2%. It's very, very small. So finally, uh, the students seem to be really enjoying this. And we have all kinds of data and research that we've done. But at the end of the day, uh, this quote from a student from Pakistan really captures a lot of the feelings that students have, which is th this was the most rewarding experience of my life in taking an online course. 
So let me stop there and, uh, and take questions. Thank you. How long does it take to prepare one such of course? The question is, how long does it take to prepare uh, an online course? Now, uh, you know, uh, you all have uh, an excellent uh, distance learning program. Uh, you have an online platform yourselves. So uh, many of you have experience creating uh, an online course. So this is no different. Um, in general, I tell people that uh, creating an online course is a bit different from teaching lectures in, in a classroom. And so usually I say, be prepared for putting in as much work as if you are developing a new on-campus course. So the first time you teach an on-campus course, you put in some amount of effort. That's the effort you put in to create an online, online course. So it's hard work. Now edX has a lot of tools to do it. Um, well, I showed you the platform. edX has a tool called edX Studio. edX Studio makes it easy for you to author a course. edX also has a course called edX 101. edX 101 is an online edX course <laughs> on how to teach an online edX course. <laughs> yes. So uh, maybe just a comment. I, I talked about this with someone who uh, offered the course at EPFL in French, actually, and he told me a figure about one hour online course, eight hours of preparation, so one to eight. So for a 30, 30 hours course, it would be uh, uh, 240, right? Uh, uh, that's rough, rough yeah, so, for, so for me, for the videos, uh, I, I, I did the Khan style uh, the videos. Uh, the first video took me about 10 hours for a video. But uh, after about a month, I was able to uh, hammer out the videos uh, roughly in about four hours per one hour, four hours for one hour of video. So once you've done a few weeks of it, you can get much more efficient. And I think you can come down to about four to one. But still, it's a lot of work. <clears throat> OK. Other, oh, uh, Renaud. Thank you very much. My question is, how do you handle copyright issues? Because when you teach, uh, most, uh, very often you like to show pictures from papers, books. Well, when you do that in your class, you put a small copyright sign and you, you feel OK. But I think that if you uh, broadcast that to the world, it can put you in some troubles. Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> so when you teach these big MOOC courses, uh, you have to uh, worry about copyright. And uh, what you do is, even in this course, I had about, uh, you, you look through your course. And if you have a lot of pictures, you've got to do something else. What did I do? So uh, in my case, uh, I had several pictures. And what I did is, uh, <clears throat> my daughter likes to draw. She was, uh, when I did my course, she was 12. And so she drew all the pictures for me. And, uh, and students love it. I mean, students love, inf students love informal stuff. OK, when you draw, you know, when you teach something in class, you draw a circle. You don't care to draw a perfect circle. You know, students get it. So approximate drawings are OK. You can do that. Uh, there's also a big industry starting, uh, industry that has popped up on open source, uh, Creative Commons license pictures and, and so on. All the music that I had in my, all the music I used here, the reggae music and so on, is open source music. It's not copyrighted music. So you, there's a huge open source community. And you can get open source uh, music. And I think with these MOOCs, we will develop more and more of that. edX is also working with many publishers and uh, with textbooks. So for example, many textbook vendors are giving edX, we are nonprofit, so it's giving us free textbooks. So as an example, for the course I showed you here, for the circuits course, it was an edX but textbook from Elsevier. And they give us a free textbook. And they discovered that the sales of the textbook worldwide went up by 500%. So, but are you saying that the, the textbook was freely available on the web? Yes. OK, but still people, still people would buy them yes. even though they were freely yes. available. Uh -huh. so, what, so what we're telling vendors is that you put a free copy on our site, and, and we put a link, a click through for people can buy the real high quality version in paper or electronic high quality version. The sales of the book went up 500%. So Elsevier called me back after one month and they said, the Professor Agarwal, how many more free books can we give you? <laughs> so, I think, so I think we're changing the dynamic of copyright. And, uh, but, but you still have to worry about it. OK, I have a question there in the back. How uh, is the response of the industries? Do they value those certificates? 
do those people get jobs because they have a certificate? So, so uh, absolutely. Um, a number of students have written us emails. Uh, there's one student that uh, said, uh, because of the grade he got in the course, uh, you know, he said that was instrumental in his getting a job at uh, Bloomberg. And a number of students are telling us that uh, these certificates are very highly valued. Uh, in fact, edX has started a uh, career placement uh, service within edX, where we pick the top 10% of the students and ask them if they want to opt in. And if they opt in, we make the resumes available to companies for recruiting purposes. So, uh, so this is, uh, so st we also did a poll for students and asked them, how important are the certificates? Do you care about the certificate? 90% of the students said that they're taking the course because of the certificate. So maybe that makes a connection with another question I may ask. So uh, MIT and Harvard both put uh, $30 million in this venture, right? So, uh, and, and so far, I'm not sure how much edX has returned. It's not a profit, for, it's not a for-profit organization, but you want to, of course, sustain yourself. So what, what, is the, what is the model there, and how are you going to make uh, money to cover all the expenses associated to edX? Uh, very good. Uh, uh, and you're not even in the business school. <laughs> a very good question. So edX is non-profit, as I said, and Harvard and MIT have uh, put in $30 million each, uh, for $60 million. And a number of the universities that have come joined us as partners have also contributed to the platform. So, uh, so we have on the order of about, uh, uh, from our university partners, another $20, $25 million. So, so right now, uh, I have a uh, funding of about uh, $75, $80 million. But even though we are non-profit, we want to be self-sustaining. And so, uh, and also, uh, as we have these courses, our universities putting up courses want to get revenues back from edX. <clears throat> and so we have a number of ways of su sustaining ourselves. One idea that I just told you about was that uh, through career placement services. So when uh, people come and recruit students, uh, we are going to get a fee from the employer. And we share that with the universities. <clears throat> a second idea <coughs> is where we uh, <clears throat> I give you the example of course licensing. So we took an MIT course, and we licensed that course to uh, San Jose State University. So there, San Jose State University pays a licensing fee to edX to license a course. And edX then does a revenue share with the producing university. A third model is that uh, even the courses are free, and right now even the certificates are free, but down the road, edX wants to charge for the certificates. So students will pay some money uh, for the certificate, and that is another revenue source. So there's many revenue sources that uh, edX is pursuing. So, so meaning that the course would be free, but only the certificate would be uh, yes. paid, right? So but students could still take the course without paying anything. That's right. Okay. Uh, so I had a question over there. So somebody asked about, does the industry validate the credits? I have the same question for universities. According to your experience, do universities validate credits that have been obtained in MOOC courses? So somebody coming and say, oh, I've, I've, I did philosophy basics. OK, we validate it in your curriculum. Does that happen? So first of all, uh, edX uh, does not give credits. In other words, uh, Universities give credits. And so edX and, and the university give certificates. Now it's up to you if you want to give uh, student credits or even students degrees. And a number of universities that have joined edX have said that they will give university credit. So for example, the UT system has 15 campuses. They're on edX. They have said that they will give campus credit, not just for UT system courses, but for courses taught by other universities. They will give low, so let's say, for example, the students take, say, UCLX course on edX, a UT, a UT system has said that they will give campus credit for such courses. That's one. Second is a number of universities, uh, we have examples of many universities around the world giving credit for edX courses. So as an example, the National University of Mongolia, they sent us a photograph of 10 students. They give 10 students uh, credit for uh, the circuits course. So they sent us a photograph of 10 students sitting there with edX certificates, and they all got uh, university credit. So we are seeing a lot of that happen. 
as more and more uh, universities are joining up, it means that you, you get a plethora of courses. Is there any sort of check on, I mean, I, I could imagine that any sort of university could give any sort of course and that would be overlap. And, and also there's the, the quality issue and in, to what extent are courses checked on, on quality, on standards that they can actually deserve the, the, the next label? Very good question again. So there's two questions. One is quality and second is uh, overlap. Let me address the quality question first. So edX wants to maintain a very high quality brand. So with edX, you will notice that edX is very deliberate. Uh, 250 universities have approached edX to join edX, but we are bringing them on very slowly and very deliberately, very carefully, because we want to maintain the brand and the quality of the brand. So with edX, our goal is that we don't want to grow too big. Uh, maybe in three years, we want to grow to maybe 30, 35 universities. And we'd be delighted to have uh, UCLX uh, join uh, edX. And so we, we want to work with you know, a small number of uh, you know, really uh, high quality universities that uh, are aligned with our mission and who also have a lot of experience with online uh, courses. Um, what we also do is that uh, we also look at the courses and we do a check on quality. So uh, if the course is not of good quality, it will not be on edX. In fact, for a number of our courses, I have personally, so before every course comes online, I personally check the course. And uh, you know, uh, there are two or three courses for which I've called the professor and I said, if you, if you don't fix this, 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 yeah, this course will not go on to edX. So the quality is very important. The second part is, uh, uh, second part is overlap. And there, it's completely up to you as a university what courses you want to put on. So if MIT has a course on circuits, you can put up a course on circuits. And it's a marketplace. So if your course is better, st students will come and pick your course. So, uh, but that said, you know, uh, you may want to talk to edX and say, uh, you know, what areas would be such where we can put up some good courses so that there's not much overlap in the beginning. But again, it's completely up to you as to what courses you want to offer. <coughs> but don't you think you're kind of reinventing the book? I mean, well-written book, students can rewind the page or stop it. And uh, I mean, that's a way actually to, for self-learning. Combined with a social network, I think that's, maybe it's oversimplification, but that's what you get roughly. Sure, so the, yeah, this is exactly a book uh, with a small difference. One is it'll play music. Second, it will grade automatically the problems for you. Uh, there's a social component. You can watch uh, the pictures and so on in your book will start moving in videos. Um, so yeah, it's almost a book with the little changes. Thanks. It'll also give you grades. You'll also get a certificate after you read the book. So uh, small changes, but yeah. Um, how do you know that Jean Dupont is Jean Dupont? So uh, <clears throat> the question, how do you know a student has, uh, who gets a certificate is who they say they are? So uh, there are, uh, here's what you do. So first of all, one kind of certificate is, if you look at the certificate carefully, it says honor code certificate. Students sign an honor code. And, uh, and uh, you know, they take the course and they get an honor code certificate. But you don't know if it's the same student or not. It could be that uh, you know, the student has uh, you know, done the exam and has cheated. You have no control over that. So we've launched a second kind of certificate called a proctored certificate. So we've signed an agreement with the Pearson, which has testing, exam testing centers around the world. They offer GMAT and other exams. And so students can go and take a proctored exam at, at those centers. And there, is, there is a center in Brussels, right? In, in There's got to be. Yeah. So, uh, so how many here have taken SATs and GMATs and GREs and so on? So where did you take it? In Near Brussels. Brussels, so okay, there you go. So that means there is a center in Brussels. So, uh, so most uh, major cities have uh, you know, uh, these centers where you can go and take these exams. And so uh, that's one approach that we've, uh, that we've taken uh, to uh, make sure that the students who uh, uh, sign up are uh, indeed who they say they are and also that they haven't cheated when they do the exam. 
Okay, we have uh, one more question. By the time the microphone gets there, can you say something about language? So we've seen courses in English, and you talked about Chinese, but uh, what, what's the position of edX with respect to language? So, uh, so uh, edX will be hosting courses on multiple languages, uh, and uh, and uh, the first few will be uh, so Australia National University, uh, which is the uh, the leading university in Australia, join edX uh, on Thursday, and they will be putting up courses in Hindi and Sanskrit. And uh, so, uh, and that will happen uh, uh, in spring of uh, uh, 2014. So we want courses, EPFL will be putting up courses in French. So uh, we'll be doing courses in uh, all languages. And we also are working on translations of the courses. But right now they're in English, but they'll be in all languages, both translations and original authored courses as well. My, my hope is that uh, that uh, you all, UCL uh, X, will offer courses in uh, French, for example. Okay, thank you. Uh, Yves. Okay. So you, you gave us some uh, proof points, such as active learning and uh, instant feedback. And in this university, in many faculties, we are using collaborative learning, such as problem-based learning, where students learn by group. So uh, is it compatible with edX? Because it, it seems that forum is quite too, too basic for that. So, uh, so a lot of students are doing collaborative learning. So one example I gave you was, uh, was cohorts, where cohorts are a way of, uh, on edX, where the forum is divided into many small subgroups. So you can, have, you can create subgroups of about 10, 20 students. And then uh, you can ask those 10 or 20 students to collaborate online and solve a problem. So it's online uh, collaboration, and you can solve problems that way. Um, many students are also gathering in meetups, in meetup groups you know, in, in, in various cities and doing things in person. But, uh, but the online collaboration is the way, is the way to do it. Uh, how do you use uh, learning analytics in order to get the course exercise better, in order to, to get them better? Do you use that? Um? Absolutely. So uh, as I said, uh, you know, research on learning is a fundamental part of uh, our mission. And so uh, we gather a lot of learning data, and uh, we are doing a lot of analytics. Um, we, will be, we will be launching <coughs> a learning analytics dashboard for professors to be able to look at uh, all the learning analytics from the course. Uh, we, we also, many papers have been written, and uh, they will be published with a lot of analytics. Uh, our platform can do A-B testing. We can support uh, alpha-beta testing so, um, so that you can give half the students one approach and the other half of the students another approach, and you can correlate against outcomes. So, so when I say that this is the particle accelerator for learning, uh, the, these examples really justify that statement. And, and, and students are particles, right? The students are the particles. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so we may, we may have time for one or two more questions before we go out for, okay, so uh, uh, Michael Petitjean. Um, in my course, I, um, I use Harvard uh, case studies. Um, if I design such a course online, uh, will I be able to use these uh, case studies, for example? You know, it's a good question. I, I, use, uh, you know, I was asked this question this morning as well. Um, the good news is, uh, you know, Harvard, uh, uh, is one of the founders of edX. And uh, Harvard Business School will be uh, uh, teaching its courses on the platform. So what I'll do is uh, just last week, uh, I was chatting with uh, Nitin Noria. Nitin Noria, the dean of Harvard Business School. I'll, I'll ask him that question. And, 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 I, and I'll tell him that, look, you know, you've got to make your cases available. Uh, but maybe, you know, I, I think what might happen is it's, it's like a textbook. How do you use the textbook uh, uh, you know, how do you use a textbook in a course? And right now, the textbook vendors are giving us free textbooks, and the sales have gone up 500%. So uh, if I was Nitin Nordia, what I would do is I'll say, okay, uh, maybe what we can do is uh, we'll do some kind of a revenue share or something like that. Right now, you buy a case for what, $2? So uh, $2 for 100 students. Um, uh, if the course is producing $10,000 in revenue, maybe you give uh, Nitin Noria and Harvard Business School maybe 5% of the revenue. So I think, I think, we, I think we will be able to work out, uh, work out some model that is a win-win for everybody. OK, so one last question. Yes? OK, 
Can you pass the microphone? Do you have information about the specific profile of your students? Because I guess that your students do not have the same socioeconomic profile, age, and mostly cognitive profile. Uh, I missed the last three words. The cognitive profile. Cognitive. The way they learn. Oh, the cognitive profile, I see. Mm -hmm. So we, are, uh, so we are getting a lot of data on our students. We do a lot of surveys um, and uh, collect data. So uh, the profiles we've been getting so far are geographical profiles. In fact, the professor's dashboard has a geographical profile. Where are the students coming from? Uh, what their uh, educational background is? So, uh, so we know that about 45% uh, of our students are college going. Uh, about 5%, 5 to 10% are high schoolers, and about 50% are continuing learners. In terms of cognitive profile, I think once we begin doing learning analytics, I think we can start uh, getting cognitive profiles. It also brings up some very interesting uh, questions for us as to uh, maybe we can create personalized learning. So once we build a cognitive profile of the student, Maybe we can also start personalizing the content to the student in the future. And so this student learns in the following way, so maybe we should present the content in, the, in, in a different manner. So we can have adaptive learning or personalized learning. To me, that's a holy grail of learning. And to me, personalized learning is the Higgs boson of learning. Really, that's, that's the key. And we hope to get there. OK, so we'll have some more time to discuss. Uh, just outside, you're all invited for a drink to discuss the Higgs boson, right, uh, or future students. And before that, I wish to thank Arendt and uh, Johannes very much for coming all the way from Boston to, uh, to, to Yuluvan. Thank you very much, Arendt.